after ticking over 100 videos the other day, I thought it was time to maybe make a few changes to what these videos look like. A little bit of different lighting today, a bit of blue going on the background, uh, and something about to pop up in a second in terms of a bit of an intro reel. Starting to lift the lift the game on the editing side of things. So hopefully you enjoy all those things. But today's video is all about a great question we had come through asking about the respiratory system, lung elasticity, breathing trainers, and even swimming and its role in terms of improving your breathing mechanics for performance. So without any further ado, let's get into it. But first, let's hit the intro. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks for joining us again for another video talking about a question that came through via Instagram from an athlete asking about things to do with the respiratory system. So if you want to get your question answered up here on the channel or join us in a live stream to get your question answered, make sure you are subscribed down below. Click that big red button. Keep up to date with all the latest videos. Head over to Instagram as well. Down the bottom right corner here at NJ underscore sports science. Send me a direct message, which is what this athlete did, uh, asking their question turn it into a video. I'll always reply with a bit of a written response as well. But if not, you get a personalized video talking about your question up here because I can guarantee someone else is thinking it as well. So head over there, get your questions in. Always happy to hear them and love how we're continuing to grow this great community with a number of subscribers getting very, very close to two and a half thousand. Hopefully you can hit it by the end of the year. As I said, very briefly in the intro, first of all, a bit of new things going on here. So hopefully you like it. Always appreciate the feedback on how these videos look, trying to up the game a little bit in terms of making them look a little bit nicer, change up the lighting a little bit, give it a bit of a, a fresh look at here in the channel after doing over 100 videos now, which is absolutely insane that we got to that point only in the space of about six to seven months, which is crazy. But today's video is all about respiratory system. A couple of key points that came through as part of this question over on Instagram, talking about things like lung elasticity, can we train it? What's going on with these respiratory trainers that are popping up um, uh, on Instagram ads, Facebook ads? You might have seen them a little bit more. They're actually popping up in a couple of um, known YouTube channels and podcasts and things like that as well. So I want to break that down. Leading into breathing mechanics and breathing efficiency, things like that. I've been doing a bit of research myself in that sort of space. So I thought it was an interesting topic. And then finally, is something like swimming good for actually improving a running, a runner or a cyclist? And even in the case of a triathlete, is swimming a really key factor of improving that breathing? So Let's get stuck in the lung elasticity part of it first. You might have uh, remembered back, I did a, a video a few weeks ago now talking about breathing in more air doesn't necessarily mean we're getting more oxygen into the system. It's just giving us best chance to be able to diffuse more, of, more oxygen into the bloodstream to then transport it and utilize it. But it's no guarantee that we're actually gonna do those two, the, those two follow-up process, the transport part or the utilization. It just means we've got more air coming into the lungs more air is gonna have more oxygen as, as a general general rule if we're at sea level. 21% of the air we breathe in is oxygen, so if we get more total air, therefore there is more oxygen inevitably in that air. What I had mentioned though, in terms of some of the things that can improve the way that we get more air in, which does give us best chance, is things like lung elasticity. Now, this is basically how well the lungs can expand. I touched on it briefly, briefly that Compared to the heart, the heart is a muscle, so that we're able to train that like we would with a bicep, our quads, etc. We can increase the size, we can increase how forcefully it can contract. That's all good and well, but the lungs are an organ. So like the stomach, like the liver, they're gonna grow and develop as we age and as we get older. So as you're a child, move into your teens, get into your adulthood, things are gonna grow and change. But at some point, they're gonna be relatively limited by your physical size. I mean, my rib cage is only so big, or my thoracic cavity is what we call it, is only so big, so I can only fit or my lungs can only expand and grow so much before it starts pushing on the edge of my rib, rib cage. It's got nowhere to go. It's the type of thing that we can improve the elasticity of those lungs once they are fully grown though, which allows them just to stretch that tiny, tiny bit more. We're not talking massive amounts here. We're just talking a little bit extra, which does allow you to fill up the lungs a little bit more, get a little bit more air in per breath, what we call tidal volume. That is gonna help get as much air into the system, which could be effective. When I say could be effective, it's not necessarily gonna be, be the be all and end all, because as I said just earlier, it's all about the oxygen consumption at the back end or the usage by the working muscle, the transport mechanism, all these parts have to work together rather than just taking in more air in the first place. So lung elasticity is gonna come through your training, stressing lungs in any extent, whether that be long, slow, continuous over a long exposure or the high intensity interval training, breathing quite rapidly and hard. All of these things are gonna change that lung elasticity a little bit, but it's the type of thing that, how much is it gonna revolutionize or dramatically change your performance? Probably not a lot. Moving into the second point, touching on these respiratory trainings, you might have seen them. I might actually try and throw up a picture if I can find one. 
a lot of them are these like little mouthpieces now. Back in the day, it was the, it was all about the the training mask, trying to improve respiratory muscle function. They were called training masks. They couldn't be called altitude masks, as we know they can't simulate altitude. But really, what it was doing is stressing the respiratory muscles, the intercostal muscles that sit between your ribs, the diaphragm, forcing you to essentially breathe harder or, or work harder to get that air in. What does that do? It trains the respiratory muscles to an extent. So yes, you're able to breathe a bit harder. But is it the type of thing that's going to, again, dramatically change your performance? Not really, because it's only one part of the equation. We're only talking about the air intake. Is it maybe a bit excessive? I think so in terms of efficiency. I mean, cool, you can breathe a bit harder, but you have to remember at the end of the day to be able to take those breaths in. If you're requiring, if you've got a little bit more muscle mass through, say, the diaphragm and you're breathing harder, the intercostals are working harder, that's all using fuel and energy and ultimately oxygen to be able to process that movement. We want to keep this process as efficient as possible because we can get that oxygen and that energy being used and created at the working muscle to allow us to propel forward if we're running, cycling, whatever we might be doing. We don't necessarily want to be wasting energy just trying to get air into the system. And that's why as you get fitter and a lot faster in particular, but especially just fitter in general, more healthy, etc., you'll notice that things like respiratory rate come down. You're not as stressed when you're breathing at high intensities because the body adapts and changes to make that process as efficient and as effective as possible. It makes it easier for you to diffuse gases. It's not necessarily about how much can we bring air in nice and forcefully. It's more about can we bring air in and can we actually get some gas exchange happening a little bit better? Can CO2 come out of the system, oxygen come into the system a bit better? Can we transport it a bit better around the system? Then can we use it? That's all the type of thing. So those respiratory trainers, Maybe there's a bit of an effect if you've got maybe a, a some sort of lung issue. If you've come off your bike, for example, and you punctured a lung, that could happen if you've broken a collarbone and that's also caused the punctured lung. Maybe you're returning from a se- severe um, injury in, uh, to the thoracic. What does that mean? Well, maybe you have to retrain some of that respiratory muscle if you've been in a severe, severe accident. That's maybe a different story. But for the everyday fit, healthy person, it's not going to do a hell of a lot. We're talking less than probably 1% gain in in what you can get. Some of these companies make some outrageous claims, I think, in terms of how much of a benefit these respiratory trainers are going to give you. I think it's all a bit silly, similar to with the training mask back in the day. They were all a bit outrageous and about it, a bit outlandish and kind of not really substantiated claims. I think there's th- similar things going on here. So I'd probably stay away from them because at the end of the day, most of them are only requiring, say, 10, 15 minutes of actual exposure each session, which you're getting more of more exposure just by going out and breathing hard in your training session or pushing yourself hard and high intensity. So uh, it's not something I think you should necessarily be worrying about or, or looking into. Just go and do the work from a physiology perspective and be smart about your training. And that's going to do a lot more for you in the long run. In terms of maybe looking at the swimming side of things, and this is where I think things get interesting in how does swimming, for example, maybe make us a little bit more efficient at breathing. And part of it, I think, comes down to you have to train your breathing and swimming. You have to be conscious and focusing on how can I make sure that I'm effective at breathing out under the water so I'm wasting no time when I get my air in. What does that also then train? That's also very similar to training what we call your CO2 tolerance. Internally, if we can really be in control fully of how much CO2 we're dumping out and when we dump it out and when we breathe out forcefully, that allows us to do a couple of things. First of all, if we can allow our body to build up a little bit more CO2 in our system, there is a little bit less affinity or what we call affinity is effectively the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin weakens when there's a little bit more CO2 in the system because that little bit of acidity helps us. What does that allow us to do? That allows us for oxygen to get into the working muscle a little bit more freely and a little bit easier. What it also does, a little bit more CO2 internally changes the concentration gradient. So we have much higher concentration in, in the body. So when we take that breath, it comes flooding out, oxygen comes flooding in, we get a good gaseous exchange. Swimming induces that naturally because when, we're, when we've got our head down underwater, we can't take a breath. You can only breathe out or hold your breath. So we naturally cause that a bit of stimulation in that process. And that's why I do think, yeah, guys who getting guys and girls who get involved in swimming, triathletes who are quite good swimmers tend to have quite good efficient breathing mechanics because they're quite comfortable at really being really good at regulating that breath, being able to swim three or five stroke turnovers without taking a breath and then going through bilaterals really easy those types of things. Whereas some who struggle with the swimming or aren't used to controlling their breath as much, really quite struggle in the pool or in the water because they feel like they have to breathe all the time, but they're also coming up. They're trying to dump carbon dioxide out, get air oxygen back in. They're taking a really short, sharp breath rather than having that really regulated flow. You can train some of this throughout your training. There's been some interesting research on nasal breathing through your long, slow sessions, something that I've adopted a bit to really, one, try to keep my heart rate down and keep me calm in those long, slow sessions. 
and also in, increase that a little bit of that tolerance, that CO2 internally to get a bit of that gas exchange happening. I also find it just helps and helps open up the airways a bit, particularly in, in longer, slower runs. Just help me get that air in and feel nice and relaxed so I can settle into a good rhythm as well. A couple of different ways we, we can do it. I've also been looking into and, and just completed the level one of what we call reflexive performance reset or RPR. Really focuses a heavy emphasis on setting a good breathing foundation, really make, making sure we're breathing down into the diaphragm and not into the chest, which is something a lot of people can get caught up doing, particularly as high intensity happens. We're a bit stressed from our day-to-day -day jobs, things like that. We start to breathe through the chest quite a bit. If we can keep control of breathing quite correctly, if you like, through the diaphragm and control, but then also a couple of little wake-up drills from the nervous system perspective to maximize the breath, open up the diaphragm, open up through our abdominals as well, free up a couple of joints so that we can make the most of that expansion. And I've sort of noticed personally, being someone who's always had a little bit of a tight chest at times when the intensity goes up when I'm a bit stressed, doing some of this RPR, which I'm gonna to bring to the channel a little bit more over the next little while and talk about it a bit more, it's actually been quite useful to be able to help me stay relaxed, feel like I open everything up, allow me to take in a nice, comfortable breath. And you might actually have noticed a kind of a bit of a funny one. I was looking through some old comments the other day on some previous videos, right when I was starting on YouTube, a little bit of nervousness, things like that. You'd actually notice, I had some comments on it, which I was a little bit self-conscious about at the time, but I'll talk about it here. Talking about when I was when I was speaking through things every so often, I'd be like, <gasps> and I still do it a little bit. I still take that big breath every so often because I'm trying to get through some things either relatively quickly, but also I'm doing all these in one take usually. I'm starting, set the camera to record, go right through, end it, upload, we're done, go from there. I think that's a really nice, clean way of doing the videos. But right in the early days, I was taking these big deep breaths in because I was a bit stressed through here. Since doing the RPR, I'm in a lot more control of my breath. As I start to get back in the pool, I also feel I'm a bit more control of my breath and doing that nasal breathing as well. So all of these things to improve my CO2 tolerance internally makes me more efficient at the breathing. So I feel like I don't have to take that big <sighs> to reset myself and go again. I can just kind of flow through and I'm pretty comfortable and a little bit more relaxed due, due, due to just day-to-day -day things. I'm just a little bit more relaxed. Heart rate stays down a little bit lower and rest as well. Some really good side effects there. So a bit of a breakdown of a couple of questions there, a bit of a longer one as well um, because I broke down a couple of topics. But if you have any comments or questions around the breathing side of things, anything we covered today, please leave them down below in the comments. Really interesting discussion, I think, that we had come through over on Instagram. So if you do have those questions that you want to get directly in touch with, down the bottom corner here, at NJ underscore sports science over on Instagram, go send me a message, send me through your question. It'll either turn into a video or if we've already covered, I'll send you the link to a video we've previously done on the channel or just provide a written response, any of those. Also join us Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Melbourne time, most weeks. Um, might have to change up a few times. I know a bit of work's coming up in the next little while, so I might have to change it a bit, but Wednesday night, we jump on, do a live Q&A, answering your questions about the science of endurance and everything sports science. Also, any feedback on the new new little setup? What do you think of the lighting? What do you think of the look of these videos? Got in a couple this week in this sort of way, so hopefully you like them a little bit better and it, it just adds a little bit more, uh, I guess, engagement to the, the channel and makes it a little bit more interesting. So. I'm going to leave it there because I've already talked long enough. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. That is it for today and we'll see you in the next one.